Okay, well, good morning. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Well, so good to see you again. I think we got off to a wonderful start yesterday evening, and even with just the short introductions that my colleagues gave, I already began to see that you're going to have a wonderfully layered experience this week, which in some ways takes the pressure off of me because I can see that we'll return to some of these issues that I raise in this opening lecture that really will seek to set the foundation for the week as we think about the literature, music, and visual art of the Harlem Renaissance. And I have to tell you, um, this is one of my favorite moments in terms of literary history, I'm an English professor by training, um, to, to think about for, for a couple of reasons. Um, and I always share this with my students. And I began to think about this yesterday when I shared Langston Hughes' The Negro Speaks of Rivers. But this is the moment where we first have African-American artists talking to each other about what they think African-American art should be, what it should do, how it should engage with other artists and other artistic movements, and to unapologetically establish what they value and what they think the US and the world beyond should value about their art. And we really hadn't had that before the Harlem Renaissance in such a concentrated way. Um, so we'll talk a bit about this. The other thing that's really important to understand about this moment is that it's not the first, right? This is not the first moment that African Americans started producing art and thinking about the relationship between the art that they are creating and the rights that they are pursuing. So Wendy mentioned yesterday that she was gonna go back to the 18th century and I'm gonna take you back this morning um, so that you understand that this soil that we're talking about that gave rise to these artistic forms um, includes nutrients that are there long before this moment of 1919 to 1940. And so what I'm hoping is that this morning we'll begin to thrust our hands into that soil to understand what it is comprised of so that we appreciate the blooms, the plants, the blossoms that come forth from this moment. Um, it will also be necessary for us to remember that although we're divorcing these artists in many ways from the other folks they were in conversation with, that's not reality. And I always tell my students this, I teach African American literature and there are many good reasons to teach African American literature as a standalone topic. But we do these artists a disservice and we would fail to truly understand why they create the art that they do if we think that they are not in conversation with other artists both in the US and across the world. If we fail to recognize that they are involved in a conversation that does not recognize some sort of false divisions based on race, ethnicity, past, right? They are very much having a conversation that is enriched and is shaped not only by um, that intra-racial conversation and concerns, but by interracial as well. So we'll keep that in mind as we go forward. Um, but there are really going to be three areas that I focus on as we think about this soil this morning. I'm gonna think about the historical moment, and that's where I'll go back to the late 18th century, and some of the events that are so important as we understand this moment. We'll think about some of the foundational voices, those folks, that really establish some of the core components of the Harlem Renaissance. And then finally, some of the publications that established the important elements that really created a firm foundation that all of our artists are going to be standing upon as we think about them. So, so I'll, I'll go through those three things, um, try to uh, incorporate some music and some art, but I'm going to definitely leave that to the other experts in that area. So this will be mostly uh, focused on the literary foundation, but that's also appropriate in terms of who was actually uh, establishing some of these ideas in written form. Um, and we'll, we'll, when we end with Locke, you'll see how he very carefully braids together uh, the music and the visual art along with the literary 
um, and then we'll look at some of those publications and think about um, why that is so important. So, so let's start with, with thinking about the historical period. And that, that probably already looks somewhat familiar to you. Um, so uh, as I noted, in, especially in terms of literature, this is not the first moment uh, that African Americans began to contribute their voice to the literary landscape. Um, this goes back to uh, the slave narrative as an early genre that allowed African Americans to first establish the importance of their view, not only of themselves, but of their contributions to what was a very newly forming nation. So when we look at the slave narrative as a genre, that begins in, in the late 18th century with James Gronesaw, Olada Equiano, these writers that tell the tale usually of their enslavement and their escape from slavery. And that's important um, that it goes even beyond uh, the experience of African Americans in this country. But when we think of the golden age of the slave narrative genre, we move immediately into uh, the middle of the 19th century with Frederick Douglass um, and the publication of his narrative in 18. 45. How, how many of you are you familiar at all with Frederick Douglass's narrative? So very important, not just uh, his narrative, but Douglass the man in terms of um, his work as an abolitionist, his articulation of black humanity in an unrelenting fashion, and his understanding that he was participating in a conversation that others, like Emerson, right, when we think of self-reliance, when we think about these core American ideals, Douglas was masterful in tapping in to those and in placing the story of African Americans and their fight for freedom as part of that larger American story. He understood slave narratives were best selling books. People loved them because it was exciting. You open this book and you're like, what's gonna happen? Oh my goodness, we have a protagonist who is smart and thoughtful, but is caught up in this horrible system that denies them the ability to be a man and to be recognized as a human being. These folks, right, these are slave narratives. They didn't wait to be freed. No, they figured out a way to escape their bonds and then to articulate why not only should they be free, but so should other blacks at this moment. So Douglas is publishing. And then we also have publications uh, like Harriet Jacobs' Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl. And we think of what women were publishing. So we have the slave narrative as a genre um, that is very important when we think about how African-American artists are imagining their contributions. And this, of course, is, is, is again, that soil. Um, but of course, slavery is abolished in 1865. And as slavery, uh, with the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863, and the slavery is abolished, right, we need a new genre. We need a new means for African Americans to continue thinking about how their artistic production will impact their reality in the United States of America. And they move from advocating their, for their humanity and their freedom to advocating for equal rights and their right to full citizenship. That is the movement that we make at this moment. Um, and we move into the Reconstruction era, which I think of as the, the, the really important era before the Harlem Renaissance. So we move from that moment of enslavement to the moment of freedom. But it's not an easy transition, right? Remember, even those Americans who were passionate abolitionists, who thought that the institution of slavery fundamentally went against core American principles and felt with all their heart that slavery was wrong, did, they did not necessarily believe in equality for African Americans. Those are two very different things. Many of them were most interested when slavery ended on a peaceful and quick reuniting of the country. And that's natural. No one, after a, a bloody civil war, no one wants to live there. People wanted to move on. There were other things they were thinking about. People were thinking about temperance and other, right, other issues, pacifism. People wanted to talk about other issues. Um, but we do have the Reconstruction era that is important in establishing where African Americans 
are post-slavery. And we usually divide the Reconstruction era into, um, into three periods. Of course, those periods um, are very important as we also think about the amendments that came forth, right? The 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. So the 13th Amendment, of course, um, saying that, sl that slavery is over. Um, the 14th Amendment saying that African Americans are indeed citizens. And then the 15th, which gave the right to vote. Not to everyone, right? Women still didn't have that right. Uh, but African American men uh, received the, the right to vote. But when we look at these, these, three, um, these three moments, uh, I think it's important to understand them as we move toward the Harlem Renaissance. So the first we think of as presidential reconstruction, right? Lincoln gives us the Emancipation Proclamation, then he's assassinated in 1865, Andrew Johnson comes and continues to build. Congress establishes the Freedmen's Bureau through the Reconstruction Act, okay? And with the establishment of the Freedmen's Bureau, the federal government actually sends in troops and others into the southern states to ensure that African Americans will receive the rights that they've been given through the passage of the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment um, and to make sure that they are safe. This then leads to what we think of as radical reconstruction from 1866 to 1873, which is a moment of profound optimism. You have African Americans being elected to federal offices, to Congress, to Senate. We have them really thinking that they're moving forward. You have Northern whites coming into the South, setting up schools. You have the birth of HBCUs. And I'm not going to um, have Howard shout outs, Howard <laughs> University shout outs as much as I could, but I'll just say that this is also the moment that yes, HBCUs are formed, that education becomes a primary issue for African Americans. So this is a moment of, um, of optimism, but it is short-lived. We then move to 1873 to 1877, which we think of as the redemption era, where those white Southerners who called themselves redeemers and wanted to take back rights for white Americans that they thought the freedom and equality of African Americans were putting in jeopardy, um, they began to assert themselves. You have the founding of the Ku Klux Klan, um, all of these things are happening at this moment. And then we have that contested presidential election between Rutherford B. Hayes and Samuel Tilden in 1877. People think that Gore Bush was like the first time that we had this issue. <laughs> Not the first time that we had this issue. We had this issue before. Um, and with that contested presidential election, the Democrats said, because Tilden won the popular vote, that they would acquiesce and let Rutherford B. Hayes become the president of the United States if the Republicans would agree to remove those federal troops from the South, okay? And that is crucial because we already had at that moment um, many Jim Crow laws that were being passed as, as, as the state governments changed hands. But with that deal, it became legal. And, and even more importantly, because now we're moving into what we call the moment of the nadir, right? N-A-D-I-R, right? The low point for African Americans. As Jim Crow laws are established, as lynching through the Klan and others becomes a part of daily life for many African Americans, you then have the Supreme Court wading in to this moment with Plessy versus Ferguson in 1896. And Plessy versus Ferguson is a crucial passage of a law because it was brought by Homer Plessy, who was an octoroon in Louisiana, who in riding a train um, said that his rights as a citizen were infringed upon because although he paid for a full price ticket to ride on a rail car, he was consigned to a segregated car. But the Supreme Court came and said, Actually, riding in that car is not a badge of inferiority, and it is legal as long as that car is separate but equal. And so separate but equal established segregation as the legal law of the land. And that had a profound impact on the reality of African Americans, who of course mostly at this point continue to live in the South. And all of this um, was really crucial when we look also at what's going on in the political landscape and who are the voices that are emerging.
I started by saying that Douglas was very important in thinking of the early literary genre of the slave narrative, but he was also important as an advocate for African Americans. He was someone who um, gave counsel to presidents. He was someone who occupied very important roles. He was the publisher of the North Star. He became a United States um, Marshal. But in 1895, he died. So his voice leaves the stage, and, and two other very important voices enter. OK. And those two voices are Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois. OK. And remember, um, these two men are, are, are thinking and writing and sharing their ideas at a moment when many of the artists that we're going to talk about are listening and are asking themselves, what is the role of black art as we look at the world around us? And a, a lot of times now, you know, we're looking back on a moment um, and we clean it up and make it neat. It was anything but neat. Um, and people often like to cast Washington in one way and Du Bois uh, in another. And I want us to, to I don't want us to do that. Um, but who's Washington and who's Du Bois? So Booker T. Washington was born a slave actually about an hour and 20 minutes from where we are right now. In the class that I'll teach this fall, um, uh, we will go to the Burroughs Plantation, which is uh, right outside of Roanoke, uh, to see where Booker T. Washington was born, which is one of the reasons I love teaching at WNL because we can make it real for our students. Uh, last time we went, um, and it's a tobacco plantation, small plantation, it was 95 degrees, and they show you how to, how to pick tobacco. And my students were like, yeah, <laughs> this, this is not what we want to be doing. Um, but Booker T. Washington uh, was born in 1856 on a small plantation um, in Virginia, the Burroughs Plantation, uh, went on to be educated at Hampton University, uh, walked himself there. It's a, please, Up From Slavery is, a, is his autobiography. It's a wonderful, wonderful text published in 1901. Um, but as a result of his training at Hampton, and then he was asked to start Tuskegee in 1881, he was only 25 years old when he was asked to return to the Deep South and found a college. It is amazing. When you go back and look at these photographs and think about what he accomplished, because he gets a bad rap these days, because people, um, it's easy to say Du Bois is wonderful and, and forward thinking and Washington was backwards, because Washington was an advocate of industrial education. And um, he was very focused on giving African Americans core skills with which he thought would be instrumental in changing their position in the South. He was of the South. He was educating folks in the South. He understood that there was a population of people with very few skills, with no guidance in terms of how to form a community on their own. They were being exploited by the new, by sharecropping, right? Slavery ending and ended and sharecropping came into being. Um, so he advocated for industrial education. But what's important in thinking about this historical arc is that in 1895, he actually gave a speech at the Atlanta Exposition where he is, uh, people look at that speech as his endorsement of segregation because he says, you know what, I'm not interested in the politics. We can be as separate as the fingers of the hand, but in terms of business, that's what we need to focus on. And many people thought he went too far, that given all that was going on in the South, he should not have willingly given up the right to fight for political equality in order to advocate on behalf of business relationships, which he thought were crucial. OK, so that's Washington. Washington is going around the country advocating for industrial education. He's a president. He's going around raising money, um, trying to, in many ways, uh, make Southerners comfortable with the idea of educated blacks. And, and he understood. He understood the environment within which he was working. But then you also have Du Bois. Um, and whenever I, I teach, I, so I teach uh, Washington's Up From Slavery first, and I go on and on about how wonderful Washington is. Then I teach the souls of black folk, and I too forget how wonderful Washington is, because the souls of black folk is just an amazing text. Um, but Du Bois uh, is born in Great Barrington, uh, Massachusetts in 1860. 
eight, so he is a New Englander. Um, but he, he comes down to the South and is, is educated uh, at Fisk, goes on to be educated at Harvard. Um, he's a sociologist. He is very erudite, goes on to do work in Germany as a, and does work in, in philosophy as well. Um, and he becomes a passionate advocate of the liberal arts model. And he will not compromise in the fight for equal political rights. So he is much more militant. And the two of them then are presenting African Americans with two very different paths in terms of moving forward um, and where African Americans should be headed. Now, the one thing I like to point out, because people started taking sides between the, the two men, should we be really um, focused on an industrial education, uh, core skills that are going to allow African Americans to farm the, the, the land in more um, advanced ways. Um, they're going to be able to, to become indispensable to their white neighbors because they know how to make bricks, and they know how to build houses. This is Washington's point of view. Or should they, as Du Bois advocates, be focused on pursuing a liberal arts education and proving their intellectual parity by the art that they produce as well as the other things that they are doing? He's an advocate of the talented 10th, that we need this top 10% that goes on and becomes educated and can pull everyone else up with them. Um, which way should we go? Well, people focus on the fact that with the publication of Up From Slavery and The Souls of Black Folk, these two are, are going in, in opposite directions. And there's a whole chapter on Mr. Washington in um, The Souls of Black Folk. So it's not as if it's subtle and people are wondering, <laughs> are they getting along or not? But Du Bois almost went to work for Washington at Tuskegee. And after Washington gave that famous speech in 1895, Du Bois actually wrote him a letter congratulating him, a word well spoken, right? And he says he would have gone to Tuskegee to teach if that offer had come before the one from Wilberforce. He ends up going to Ohio. Um, but very quickly, they, they did part ways. But I share that because it's important for us to understand this was a churn. This was people reading different ideas, responding, wondering which way should we go? What is the role of politics? What is the role of art as we move forward? And people were not certain, OK? But Washington dies in 1915. He literally works himself to death on, on behalf of Tuskegee. Um, du Bois lives until 1863. So he has a much longer time. So he's going to be one of the folks that I identify as one of those foundational voices of the Harlem Renaissance. But there are a couple of other things historically that are going on that are important to keep in mind as we think about these two men and the different views that they are offering to African Americans at this moment. One is World, World War I, right? So World War I breaks out in 1914. The United States doesn't enter until 1917, but this is crucial in terms of the opportunities that African Americans began to see available um, for themselves. Most of them were still residing in the South, but with World War I, we have about 200,000 African American men who actually go overseas and fight. But probably more importantly, we have many now looking to the uh, cities of the Northeast and the Midwest. We have white men that are leaving to go fight, and these new jobs are opening up, both for white women, but also for African Americans. So we see the beginning of the first wave of the Great Migration. Okay? What else adds to that wave, 1910 to 1940? And people will argue over how many go um, between the first and second migration, but anywhere from 1.6 million to about 2 million African Americans pick up from the South and begin moving to places like Harlem, DC, Detroit, Chicago, right? It's not, they're not all going to Harlem, um, but we're gonna think about why Harlem becomes such an important space uh, where they land. But we also have um, lynching which is, is, is unfortunately expanding at a rapid rate because of what I talked about in terms of the end of the Reconstruction era and the establishment of Jim Crow laws. We have over 3,000 um, African Americans who are, are lynched during this, this period. And then we have things that are less sexy but also contributed like the bull weevil infestation, a nasty little pest that came um, and attacked the cotton crop 
And this is a moment before, agriculturally speaking, that we were sophisticated and understood the necessity of rotating crops. So the decimation of the cotton crop in many of the southern states had an outsized impact on African Americans who were sharecroppers. Um, so these things together encouraged many African Americans to say, we, we, need to, we need to change, we need a new, a new opportunity. So many of them started moving to different cities, uh, but Harlem was one city that attracted African Americans at high numbers, attracted African Americans who were unskilled laborers as well as those who were in the middle class. Uh, for many reasons. Harlem, was, was, Harlem existed long before um, this moment where we begin to see in the early uh, 20th century African Americans leading the South and going up North. It was originally a Dutch uh, city and then was populated by um, Italians and Jewish Americans. Um, but with uh, 1904, uh, there was a real estate crash. There were lots of things that were happening. Um, I was thinking about, I don't know if any of you have seen that movie, The Gangs of New York. You know, things begin to, to come together. But all kinds of things are happening um, in, in Harlem in these spaces. Uh, but many, after this real estate crash, we have um, Philip Payton who comes in and, and forms um, the African American Realty Company and begins to invite African Americans to Harlem specifically. And Harlem was beautiful. It had wide boulevards, it had these beautiful um, townhouses, these row houses, um, and African Americans started to come and to live in Harlem. It had its cabarets, which I'm sure Damani will give us a sense of what was going on in those spaces, um, but it becomes a real beauty of a city where, where African Americans are coming from all across the South and putting down roots. Um, so Harlem becomes that space. Okay into that space we have also these foundational voices that are telling that are suggesting to african americans how they should comport themselves remember washington has died du bois continues and du bois is very smart very thoughtful um, and really hard working as he imagines the way forward for African Americans. And, and one of the things uh, that Du Bois does, he attends in 1910 um, the National, uh, I'm sorry, um, the National Negro Congress, uh, which leads first in 1909, the second one in 1910, which leads to uh, the founding of the NAACP, right? Um, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Um, as that organization is founded, Du Bois is tapped to be the director of publicity and research. And in that role, he is asked to publish the organ of the NAACP, which he names the crisis. Um, and this is the uh, earliest uh, copy of the, the cover of the, of the crisis. Um, and this becomes one of the most widely read, I think at, at its height, 100,000 people. Um, that's the circulation of the crisis, where Du Bois is articulating mostly political ideas um, and, and, and sharing news. But he also, because of his appointment of Jesse Redmond Fawcett as the literary editor from 1918 to 1925, allows the crisis to become a major organ for the production of African-American art. So remember, it has this huge circulation. You have all of these African-Americans coming from the South, seeking new opportunity in Harlem and other cities, but Harlem is, is where many of them congregate. And he is publishing the crisis, which is articulating political ideas, telling them about current events, but also introducing them to the new voices of the age. Those voices, whether they be visual artists or musicians or literary artists, who are asking themselves what role will art play in shaping the way forward for African Americans. So now we are beyond just thinking about the soil, the historical context that gave rise to the Harlem Renaissance, but we're thinking about those seeds that were planted because these men, and there are, there are going to be men that I talk about first, um, plant these seeds, but 
the women are there, right? They, this would not have gone the way that it went without Jessie Redmond Fawcett. She's the one who published Langston Hughes' The Negro Speaks of Rivers in 1921. And I love the, the letter when she writes, because Hughes is traveling the world, he's all over the place. And, and uh, so, um, so I did my graduate work at Yale where we have uh, the Beinecke. The James Weldon Johnson collection is the largest collection of um, writing from this period. And so you get to read all these letters. And it's just, it's amazing. Um, so Fawcett writes to, to Hughes and she says, who are you? <laughs> right? Who are you? Tell me more about you. And you, you see all these letters. And poor Hughes, I don't know how he got any writing done because he was a correspondent, a, 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 a writing letters to the whole white world. Everybody loved Hughes. Um, but, uh, but Fawcett working with Du Bois is instrumental in giving voice to these, to these artists um, at this moment. Um, but Du Bois begins to question what these artists were publishing. And he begins to recognize that many of them are not focused on the political reality in overt terms of African Americans, but they are just writing pretty work. And Du Bois didn't like that. And so when he published the Criteria of Negro Art in 1926, he made very clear his dislike. And I want to um, read this. He famously declared this. Thus all art is propaganda and ever must be, despite the wailing of the purists. I stand in utter shamelessness and say that whatever art I have for writing has been used always for propaganda, for gaining the fight of black folk to love and enjoy. I do not care a damn for any art that is not used for propaganda, but I do care when propaganda is confined to one side while the other is stripped and silent. He does not mince words in terms of his view of the role of black art at this moment. And this is crucial. He's a pragmatist. Du Bois is looking out and saying, well, you're writing your nice poems and short stories and novels and presenting what you think of as the beauty of African-American culture. Others are out there lynching African-Americans. We've had the summer of 1919 where we see African-Americans lynched at untold numbers. Um, and he is saying, we don't have the luxury of producing an art that is not always thinking about how it is contributing to the political progress that African-Americans so desperately need to focus on. So what's important about, about Du Bois in thinking of him as a foundational voice of the Harlem Renaissance is that he allows other artists to position themselves in relationship to this proclamation. And they do. They do position themselves. And I want us to, to think about the other two. That's what we're going to spend the rest of our, our time thinking about. First is James Weldon Johnson, um, who is, is often thought of as the father of the Harlem Renaissance. We have, we have Du Bois, who's one of those foundational voices. We have James Weldon Johnson, who many of us think of as the father. And then we're going to end with Locke, who is the dean of the Harlem Renaissance. Um, but first, first the father. And James Weldon Johnson uh, is also someone who, when you read the letters that he is writing um, to others, such a generous man, such a beautiful person. Um, and, and a passionate advocate for African Americans. He loved, he loved black people. So he was born in Jacksonville, Florida. I know we have some Floridians, so I'm gonna give you a shout out. Um, he was born in Jacksonville, uh, Florida, into a very uh, middle class home um, and uh, grew up there uh, with parents. Uh, his father was um, a head waiter, his mother was, was a teacher. He himself, however, went to Atlanta for his education. Um, and that was a, a really important experience for James Weldon Johnson uh, because that su the summer after his first year in 1891, um, he goes and in, in teaches in rural areas of Georgia. And Du Bois had a similar experience uh, at Fisk. He went into rural Tennessee. Because remember, at this moment, for, for African Americans who were growing up in these middle class homes, many of them didn't have a real understanding of what it was like to be growing up in these rural areas of the South. They didn't really, they couldn't imagine living in cabins where people had one fork, right? Washington has a chapter on um, the gospel of the toothbrush, 
And people read this and they're like, what's he talking about? People didn't know about brushing their teeth. There were basic hygienic things that people didn't know about. Men liked to boy some jaunts and they didn't know anything about that. And it wasn't until they went to college and then over the summer, many of them would go out into these rural towns to educate African-Americans, children, and, and up to adults, who could only go to school sometimes over the summer because they were needed to work the fields. And so these moments were often transformational. And it, this, for, for, for James Weldon Johnson, was a transformational moment for him when he went out and got to know um, these, these, these children, these rural children. And at that moment, he declared that his education, his classical education was a trust that he wanted to give back to the people. And he became principal of his hometown. He goes back, it's amazing what these, these young people were accomplishing um, at this moment. You couldn't say, well, I'm, you know, I'm only 20. You're 20, but you're going to be the principal, or you're going to go found a college. Um, because we, we, we needed everyone, all hands on deck uh, at this moment. And, and one of the first things he did uh, when he went and became principal of his, of his hometown back in, uh, uh, of a school in Jacksonville was he worked with his brother, Rosamond. Um, and they uh, wrote, lift every voice and sing. Uh, Johnson writes it, uh, Rosamond actually uh, puts it to music, um, and they're gonna go on to have great success on Broadway. Uh, but this was, this became um, known uh, as the Negro National Anthem. Um, they wrote it in commemoration of Abraham Lincoln's birthday, uh, and it becomes uh, a, major, a major piece when we think about the Harlem Renaissance and it being republished. And in case you've not heard it, because it is something that I love, I graduated from a high school where we had to know it, we had to stand up and recite it, and I am so thankful that every time Black History Month rolls around, because if you haven't heard it, that's when you will hear it, um, <laughs> that, that, that I know these words, but more, more so because it's, it's, it's beautiful, so I want us to, to listen to it. <laughs> 
glad you enjoyed that because I love it so much, so much. Um, okay, I don't know what that is. Uh, so, <laughs> let me, um, so, so, so this is this is Johnson. This is Johnson giving voice explicitly to a celebration of African American heritage. He is giving an overview of the history of African Americans in this country. And if we were to go stanza by stanza, this is three stanzas. The first one, he encourages African Americans not to run past their history, but to think about it, to reflect on it, to learn from it. But he's also wanting to share that with others. And that's something that we can take today. There's no reason to run past the difficult parts of our history. There's so much to learn, right? There's so much to build on if we can only be patient enough with ourselves to dig into it. Then he moves on in that second stanza to celebrate the strength that has emerged in African Americans as a result of living through that history. All that they have learned in the gifts that they are now prepared to offer to a waiting nation. And, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about this in, a, in relationship to a poem. But finally, um, when he says that he's, he's worried about African Americans drunk with the wine of the world, forgetting their past, he is also admonishing African Americans not to begin to focus on simply making money, having new positions, having new opportunities, such that they forget that past, they forget those struggles, they forget their cultural values that are distinct and beautiful and worth sharing, but that they remain committed to that history, to that cultural singularity, but also to their current home, right? To their native land, but also to their current home. So it's a, it's, 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 it's a beautiful poem, and it, it begins to establish what James Weldon Johnson wants to bring um, to these ideas. So he's in New York working with his brother on Broadway, becomes in 1913 the editor of the New York Age, which had been a journal um, really advocating um, for Booker T. Washington's ideas. Um, but he was not an ideologue. He was someone who wanted to unite different factions. But he does become someone who parts ways with Du Bois in saying that all art should be political and propagandistic. And what's really important that he publishes is the Book of American Negro Poetry in 1921. So we have the crisis um, as the organ of the NAACP that is a crucial organ in terms of articulating the ideas of the Harlem Renaissance, and we also have the Book of American Negro Poetry, and most specifically, the preface. In that preface, um, because Johnson, and this will be the same for Locke, very much aware of other literary movements. He was very much aware um, of, of the Irish Renaissance, right, led by Yeats and Singe and others, and the ideas emerging from, from there, and that they were drawing on that Gaelic heritage. They were not running away from their past, but they were drawing upon it to infuse the art that they were producing at that moment with a particularly modern outlook. Johnson was aware of that. Um, but he was most interested in the manipulation of language and how through the manipulation of language and visual, and I'm sorry, and literary art, um, that that is how African Americans were going to make progress. So he called for um, uh, literary sophistication. And you have to remember, so, so this is a moment, right? Who, who else is writing? This is the moment when we uh, have the high modernist right? Uh, they've been writing since uh, the turn of the century into the 20s, and um, they, they, they're, they're sharing these ideas. Uh, so Michael and I just led a spring term course to Paris uh, this past spring where we really focused on African American writers of the Harlem Renaissance who spent time in France and um, wrote and featured uh, Paris and other cities in their text. But what's wonderful is they're also, you know, they're, they're engaging with other writers. I love, there's a letter by Gwendolyn Bennett, who is a poet that we won't talk about, but if you'd like to, she's a good poet of the Harlem Renaissance. Um, but she goes to a party and she's writing to a friend and she says, I met this cool guy, he's full of energy and 
blessed her, and I think his name is Alan. And then in the next letter, she's like, oh, actually his name was Ernest Hemingway. He's really cool. <laughs> um, so they're like, they're discovering each other and meeting each other at parties. And you know, they're just, they're just young writers and artists who are exchanging ideas. Um, but Johnson was, was aware of that and aware of these movements. And in the preface to the Book of American Negro Poetry, he, he doesn't only focus on literature. He says what is so crucial that we must understand about African-American artists is that they are the artists who have contributed the only very original, distinctly American art forms to the United States. Remember, we're a young country. And many of the things that we were doing early on, right, we're looking to Britain and other places and we're, you know, taking what's good uh, and, and working it in to our experience. But what Johnson wants to say is that African Americans are not apologizing for producing a distinctly American art form across a number of areas. So he looks specifically and says, here are the four major contributions that African American artists give to the United States, the Uncle Remus stories, spirituals, the cakewalk, and ragtime. And he says, African American artists must take seriously the responsibility for claiming the richness of this artistic productivity, the originality of it, and the fact that it is also, it's, it, there's a patriotism there because we want to create something that could only be created by those who've had the experience of living in the United States. And so, and, and he, he, he says very clearly that all people, and I'm gonna quote, are measured to a great extent by the literature and art they produced. And that this is what was going to convince others of their intellectual parity the quality of their art. So this is a very different argument that he's making. He's not saying the art itself has to be political, but that they need to unapologetically remind others that they are producing great art and that that production is the best argument against those who would say that they're not human beings, that they are not worthy of being seen as equal citizens, that the power of the art, the sophistication of the art, the, fan, the fact that it is foundational leading to other art forms is what is going to help them move forward. And he offers an outline, one of the earliest ones of African-American literary tradition. He goes back to Phyllis Wheatley, um, who I love to start with, and we have actually an early uh, 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 copy of Phyllis Wheatley's poems in our, our archives here, our special collections. I, I don't know if Tom will mention that, but I always share it with my students. Um, but he, he shares that arc and makes that argument unapologetically. Um, and says, quote, I believe the richest contribution the Negro poet can make to the American literature of the future will be the fusion into it of his own individual artistic gifts. And then he warns of the danger of allowing purely polemical phases to choke, uh, of the race problem, to choke their sense of artistry. So he, he, he charts out a different position. Um, and he does so while also uh, publishing uh, wonderful poetry. So I think we have time. I'm gonna watch my time. I meant to have out my cell phone, which is a more exact time. Um, so I wanna share with you, uh, oh, Black and Unknown Bards. I don't think I have time to read this. Um, so, as much as I, 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 I want to, it's very hard. I wonder if I can read it very quick. I'm going to read it very quickly um, and just give you, because I think it's important for you to hear the poetry, um, to understand the work that this art is doing and how these men are not just writing a preface where they're articulating ideas, but then they are also publishing art that embodies, that gives life to those ideas. O oh, black and unknown bards of long ago, how came your lips to touch the sacred lyre? How in your darkness did you come to know the power and beauty of the minstrel's lyre? Who first from midst his bonds lifted his eyes? Who first from out the still watch lone and long, feeling the ancient faith of prophets rise within his dark kept soul, burst into song? <laughs> 
part of what slave poured out such melody as steal away to Jesus? On its strains, his spirit must have nightly floated free, though still about his hands he felt his chains. Who heard great Jordan roll? Whose starward eye saw chariot swing low? And who was he that breathed that comforting, melodic sigh? Nobody knows the trouble I see. What merely living clod with ca what captive thing could up toward God through all its darkness grope and find within its deadened heart to sing these songs of sorrow, love, and faith, and hope? How did it catch that subtle undertone, that noted music heard not with the ears? How sound the elusive reed so seldom blown, which stirs the soul or melts the heart to tears? Not that great German master in his dream of harmonies that thundered amongst the stars at the creation ever heard a theme nobler than go down Moses. Mark its bars how like a mighty trumpet call they stir the blood. Such are the notes that men have sung going to valorous deeds. Such tones there were that helped make history when time was young. There is a wide, wide wonder in it all, that from degraded rest and servile toil, the fiery spirit of the seer should call these simple children of the sun and soil. O oh, black slave singers, gone, forgot, unfeigned, you, you alone of all the long, long line of those who've sung untaught, unknown, unnamed, have stretched out upward seeking the divine. You sang not deeds of heroes or of kings, no chant of bloody war, no exulting pain of arms won triumphs, but your humble strings you touched in chord with music empyrean. You sing far better than you knew. The songs that for your listeners, hungry hearts suffice still live. But more than this to you belong. You sang a race from wood and stone to Christ. So what is Johnson giving us there? This poem is an ode to African-American poets who were not deemed poets, who were not even deemed human beings. He is saying that these, these unknown bards these African-American slaves who created the sorrow songs did so not at a moment that was bereft of anything positive. People will look at slavery and say nothing. Blacks did nothing during that time. There is nothing of worth that emerged from African-Americans. And Johnson says, not so fast, not so fast. Those sorrow songs are not just songs that made the day go past while you were toiling out in the fields, those are poems that are beautiful and that accomplish so much. And when he wonders, right, in that third stanza, what merely living clod, what captive thing, he is using the language of those who would dehumanize African Americans to say, how could that be? How could they be mere captive things, living clods, and create such beauty? How is that possible? And of course, the answer is it's not possible. He is pronouncing black humanity. And he is saying, yes, German masters, great musicians created beautiful music, but they didn't create things as beautiful as Go Down Moses. That's not something they can claim. And what he is also implicitly arguing when this goes back to the preface is, shouldn't we all be proud that these are our countrymen who are producing this original art that we can claim as our own in this country. And in the end, when he says, you sang not deeds of heroes or of kings, he might list the things that when we think of great poems, we often say, here are the subjects. He says, that's not what they sang about. That was not their focus. But what they accomplished with those spirituals, what they managed to do, right? for their listeners' hungry hearts was salvation, was giving them back their humanity. Is that not more than simply celebrating some heroic deed on a battlefield? So he claims 
that mantle of artist for African Americans. And you see he does so without making it overtly political. I, I think it's beautiful. So, so that's, that's, what, that's what Johnson is doing. And I want to I wanna end with Locke. And Locke is, is crucial. Alan Leroy Rock, who is the dean of the Harlem Renaissance, and I imagine we'll come back to him a couple of times. Um, born in Philadelphia in 1885, uh, to a very uh, well-to-do family. Um, he's descended by free, uh, from free blacks. His father worked for the Postal Service. His mother was a teacher. Um, he ended up attending Harvard. In 1907, he becomes the first African-American Rhodes Scholar and goes off to do that work, returns, um, and becomes a long-term professor at uh, Howard. So I have very fond memories as an English major taking all my classes in Locke Hall. Uh, that is still there. Um, and, and, and Locke, uh, even maybe more so than Johnson and others, was very aware of other movements of the moment and very thoughtful about how to insert African American artists into those emerging movements, right? He understands about the Irish Renaissance, high modernism, and he understands that African Americans deserve to be right there. Um, it, very importantly, there was a Civic Club dinner in uh, 1924, March of 1924. It was ostensibly a gathering to celebrate the publication of Jesse Redmond Fawcett's There Is Confusion. Locke was asked to be the MC, and he said he would only do so if it didn't focus on one writer, but focused on many writers and artists. And he did such a fantastic job that he was asked to publish uh, a special issue of Survey Graphic in 1925, where he brought together some of these new voices, um, these emerging poets, uh, but others as well. And it was a hit, so much so that he quickly, uh, Locke was not one to let a good moment pass by, he quickly put together um, what was called the New Negro, which was a compendium in 1925 that he published. And that includes chapters on the spirituals. It includes chapters on jazz. It includes chapters on visual artists, as well as on poets, uh, has poems and, and, and short stories and plays. Um, but there he begins to articulate the difference between the new Negro and the old Negro. And you'll often hear the Harlem Renaissance, people will also talk about the new Negro movement um, in many ways because of the title of Locke's compendium that set out in such clear terms some of the major ideas of the Harlem Renaissance. So I think a very appropriate place to end our discussion today as we think about these, these seeds. Because one of the things Locke wanted to do was to explain all that was happening in terms that didn't just present African Americans as folks that you know things were happening around them and they were sort of responding to this historical event or that event, but he wanted to say there was intention, there was thought behind all the choices, not just that African-American artists or the, ten, the top talented 10th were, were thinking, but also that the masses themselves were acting with intention um, and individuality, taking their own future into their hands. So you have um, the complete essay in your binder um, of uh, the, uh, this is this is Locke's uh, *The New Negro*, but you, you you'll be able to read that in its completion. But I wanted to just share this moment uh, where Locke begins to put words around what is happening around everyone at this moment, and what I've tried to give you a sense of this morning in terms of the arc. Uh, that gave rise to the Harlem Renaissance. And he says, the wash and rush of this human tide on the beach line of the northern city centers is to be explained primarily in terms of a new vision of opportunity. With each successive wave of it, the movement of the Negro becomes more and more a mass movement toward the larger and the more democratic chance. In the Negro's case, a deliberate flight not only from countryside to city, they're not just leaving the country, but from medieval America to modern. But are we, after all, reading into the stirrings of a sleeping giant, the dreams of an agitator? The answer is the migrating peasant. For generations, the Negro has been the peasant matrix of that section of America, which has most undervalued him. And here he has contributed not only materially in labor and in social patience, but spirituality as well. Do you see him braiding together many of the things we see emerging and, 
in, in Du Bois, but also in Johnson. A second crop of the Negro's gifts promises still more largely. He now becomes a conscious contributor and lays aside the status of beneficiary and ward for that of collaborator and participant in American civilization. Do you see how deftly he's bringing together core ideas? No, it's not just the bull weevil. It's not just that there were new jobs as a result of World War I. It's not just the heinous practice of lynching. But it is the idea that they themselves want new opportunities, are seeking and imagining a new future for themselves, not just rooted in political agitation, but even within those agricultural workers, those folks coming from these rural small towns, they are imagining the gifts that they will contribute to the country if given a chance. That crop is the Negro's gifts. They are now a conscious contributor, right? Because people are saying they're a problem. Look at them coming into cities and living in, 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 in lower class places and bringing crime. He is saying, no, they're coming with new ideas, new hopes, new dreams of a future. And they want to be a collaborator and participant. That is what Locke gives us as he articulates the foundational ideas of the Harlem Renaissance. Now, we're gonna have time this week to talk about the difficulties. I've not touched upon the issue of white patronage that is there. I've not talked about the way that the ideas of primitivism are exploited. All of these things will, will emerge. But what I wanted to give you today is a sense of the soil and the seeds that were so rich, so complicated, that these artists, their roots go down deep into and then from about 1919 to 1940, there is a flourishing as a result of those seeds and that soil. So we are in for a feast. Thank you. So now good. I, I, I never, I think, lecture like this. This is new for me. So hearing my own voice uninterrupted for a long time. Yes. Lena, I wish I could say this in gold. This has been helpful. Thank you. We've learned so much from you. And as a beginning talk of this week, this really sets the stage for so many thoughts and so many questions, I'm sure that will come forward to you. But thank you so much for this talk. I'm glad we got it. <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Um, in the abstract, I understand what the Jim Crow laws were. Could you comment on those more specifically? Sure. So the Jim Crow laws, um, that's a good question because there are so many. So when we hear today, people talk about uh, voting laws. So many of them were things like that. Um, so a, an example of a Jim Crow law would be to say, OK, uh, the passage of, of the 14th Amendment, like now you, in the 15th Amendment, now, now you have the right to vote. But what we're going to say is you do, but only if your great grandfather also had the right to vote. So all of a sudden, you're saying to yourselves, well, we're not undermining those federal laws, but we're putting other laws in place that in reality undermine those laws. You could just multiply them. So whether it be, you know, you can't go to school together. You have all these people coming down saying we're creating schools. All of a sudden, yeah, you can create those schools, but if there's a white school in your area, you can't go. Jim Crow law. So, it, you know, they just went on and on. And after um, 1896, it, they were just unleashed because it was legal, separate but equal. You know, when I talk to my parents about what it was like growing up in the South, my mom says, yeah, we got the encyclopedia set that the white school was done with. Maybe it didn't have S. You know, a lot of important things happen in S. Um, maybe it didn't have other things. So, so, so separate but equal was never equal, right? It was never equal. 
Um, and so, and the Jim Crow laws were, by and large, the reason that was the case. Yeah. On the slide, you had uh, James Rowan Johnson. Yeah. There was reference to Kate Wall. Yes. What, what was that? Oh, gosh. Um, so at some point this week, we should show a, 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 a we should have a presentation. So the, the, the cakewalk um, was a dance in many ways. Um, and couples performed the cakewalk. There were very intricate steps. Some people made fun of the cakewalk, but in Europe, people were crazy also about the cakewalk. And um, so couples would, would do these intricate steps and the couple who was judged uh, to be the most elegant in comportment, the most intricate in the steps, would win, and they would often win a cake. <laughs> so, uh, so the cakewalk was a, a form of dance, a form of dance. It's a very good question. Yes. Um, how is Uncle Remus <laughs> viewed now? It's become a little controversial. That's a, yes. Um, so, so yes, when we look at some of the Uncle Remus tales and others, people think that um, in many ways they reinforce some negative stereotypes of African Americans. But you know what's really interesting about the Harlem Renaissance, and we'll definitely get into this with um, Zora Neale Hurston, whenever I say her name. I love, Zora is why I do what I do. So I'm just gonna tell you, if you didn't enjoy their eyes for watching God, don't tell me that. Um, <laughs> Uh, but, but Hurston and others uh, were very, and, and Hughes and, and, and Brown, who we'll talk about, were very focused on not just showing what people might say, you know, the educated classes, the refined images of African Americans. So when we look at the Uncle Remus tales and other uh, art forms that we might say, you know, well, that's not sophisticated or that doesn't seem like a polished picture of African Americans, it's actually part of the Harlem Renaissance, bringing it all together and saying, this is, this is necessary when we think about who we are as a people. Um, some of the greatest mistakes we've made in history are trying to erase things, cover things up that we are discomfited by. Uh, and for many African Americans, they said, especially during this moment, this is a part of our cultural heritage. Um, and, and there is beauty in the stories that are shared on front porches and when people are working in sawmills. There's, there's, there's something unique and powerful about that. So, so yes, um, I would say the Uncle Remus tales are something that fit into that category of not always uh, an area that we you know, take great pride in. But don't throw me in the briar patch is one of the best lines ever written in there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Jim. Yeah, so uh, one question I had, Linda, is uh, you talked about Booker, Wash Booker T. Washington as being an advocate of uh, industrial education, whereas uh, W.B. Du Bois was more an advocate of liberal arts. And so I, I guess I'm wondering that strand of industrial education, did that survive? And I mean, I mean Locke talks about it just sort of uh, in passing in that last paragraph, but did industrial education survive into the uh, Harlem Renaissance? Uh, yes. When we look at many of the HBCUs um, that are the, the, the early important spaces, whether it be North Carolina A&T or FAMU, I mean, you know, we could go down and think of uh, how many of those schools really focused early on on industrial education um, because it was seen as a, a pragmatic approach uh, to educating uh, African Americans to intervening immediately in the most pressing problems, which for many, is, you know, were, how are you going to make a living? Um, how are you going to provide for your family? And so um, the problem is, is that it should never have been so strict a division. And it really wasn't. Why was Washington trying to get Du Bois to come teach at Tuskegee if all he wanted to do was talk about how to grow sweet potatoes? And I say that in a meaningful way because it was important for us to think about all the things you could do, right, with a sweet potato. Uh, but it was also important to teach poetry in different languages and literature to these students. And both of those things were happening even at industrial schools. So my, my point there is it was never as strict a division. And, and, and one of the things that people um, rightly critiqued Washington for is Washington um, was a political animal. Uh, mostly he had to be because he was doing this work in the South. But he would say one thing publicly and then behind the scenes, he was working on political issues. He was not someone who, who thought. But in Up From Slavery, there's this moment where he says one of the saddest things he ever saw was a young black boy sitting uh, with a book of poetry and some you know, um, eyeglasses 
uh, with weeds growing around him, spots on his pants, and, and no job. And, and so people looked at that and said, why would you hold that up as something that we should avoid, as if the two cannot coexist, as if you cannot, on the one hand, make money in a living for yourself and also enjoy reading poetry. Um, the two don't have to be divorced. Yeah. Okay, Rena, thank okay. you again. Thank you.